All right, thanks for staying with us. Now, if, if food security means all people have access to culturally appropriate nutritious food at all times without relying on emergency supplies, or in our case, palliative, <laughs> what we witnessed across Nigeria where warehouses were heavily looted tells us we are in a state of emergency as it relates to food security in Nigeria. Now, let us hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join this conversation. Tweet at us at Plus TV Africa or at We Show Africa One with the hashtag We Show, or you send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 081 8034 663. All right, so, um, Aki, I'm going to come to you first, you know, because we were talking just before the show started and you were giving me some very scary, you know, revelations really and all scary of that. Stuff. Yeah. So where are we at in terms of food security in Nigeria? Well, if you look at the report, um, the report by the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, it says that 91.1% of Nigerians will not be able to afford a balanced diet. 91.1, if we were to go by that report. And it, it, it's scary because even the food insecurity that we're talking about is going to be global. Already we're facing mm. it. So um, <laughs> that place where you want to go and import food, that's if, if you even find the effects to go and import food may actually be catering for the people. So it's just really scary when you look at the numbers and you begin to wonder what will happen. Okay, we're not producing enough because of various reasons. And you don't even, in the places where you have to now import, you can't also do that conveniently because you do not have the forex to be able to import food. So it's just scary times ahead, people, scary times yeah, ahead. So I, I was reading this report, um, um, I think February 2018, where uh, World Farmers Association, apparently they have an association, I did not know that. <laughs> so they're saying that uh, they produce enough food worldwide to feed 10 billion people. And the world is not even up to 10 billion. We're about 7 point something billion people. So why then do we have a lot of hunger going on? And according to the report, they were blaming it mostly on conflict and food um, uh, mismanagement or food, exactly. food, food waste. So, yeah. yeah, because... I read somewhere that about 70 or 60 percent of the food that's been produced is goes wasted. To waste. Mm, goes yeah, to waste. so yeah. now we now go to talk about infrastructure mm -hmm. and um, resources available to farmers mm. and also matter of security, which is very, very important. Yeah. So is there the arable land to farm? Yes, there is. But are we able to use that land to provide Food for ourselves is now not a that, problem. That, that's uh, the that question. We, yes, mm -hmm. that's the question. Well, that well, we I'm need Sansi to was ask. mentioning something that about um, people's um, farmers. Yeah. Yes. Oh yes, this is. I think it's a developing story. I think it broke on Twitter um, yesterday. It was originally carried by BBC Hausa. So in certain local governments in Katsina State, Zamfara, and Kaduna State, maybe there are other states that we don't know yet. So what bandits do is they block the entrance or the road to farms, and they insist that these farmers have to pay harvesting fee. So the harvesting fee ranges from three hundred thousand naira to maybe 900,000 naira. So the bigger your farm, the more they have to tax you. But I don't get And it. so to cover up, these farmers, when after paying those fees, they now have to bill us more. For the people that know, can, so they can even cover afford up. Wait, to pay. Wait, yeah, yeah, so can... fee, is it your farmland? What? Like the, 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 the F country that banditry has taken in this country. It's amazing. It's just really, really, it's really tiring. Yeah. Someone, I think it was a video, I don't know who shared the video about um, insurgents being paid um, mm -hmm. 300 and something million to, to rebrand re them, Boko Haram people, while um, uh, ASU, I think it's 3 billion or uh, I suppose 300 billion. It's just, it's just ridiculous. The, the, the impunity, Our priority do you understand? Like, is, uh, it's just lopsided. You know, so how can you stop me? Because you know I'm a farmer. Maybe that's why my temperature no, 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 is so going it, up. It, it, I spent money. I have bought farmlands. I have planted. It's the same I am harvesting. You're not telling me to now, to now pay, pay you, you to go and harvest my farmland. It makes no sense. And Definitely. when you can't afford the fee, automatically the food is a waste. Yes. You know, and this is where we're talking about where the security comes in. Yeah. What is the government doing about this? Are they saying that they're oblivious of all this? They things cannot that are going say that. On? They can't say okay. that. So the, the, the issues are so deep. And I'm, I'm telling really, you, really yeah, we're looking, we're looking forward, forward to, to talking yeah. to Inkiro. Now, Inkiro Pareke is the CEO founder of Enviro Grow 
um, Farms, and she's joined the conversation via Zoom. Thank you so much for joining us in Kiro. Thank you for having me. All right, so you've been hearing our, our little banter on food security and some of the causes that we, we um, try to, you know, to find out you know, from ourselves online. But you are a farmer, so maybe you should tell us what the situation is for you as a farmer and why we are being, I mean, why are we in this, uh, we're at the verge of real scarcity of food in Nigeria? Actually, I don't know what to add to the conversation because you ladies covered it all. Um, one of the biggest problems we farmers have is security. A lot of us, the access roads to where our farms are, are so bad that it takes you forever to get there. I left for the farm this morning at 8.30. I was stopped for about three hours at Awaya coming back from Ekbe. It took me a journey of one, one hour, 30 minutes, took me about five hours. I, I wasn't sure I was going to make it back on time. And that's the situation for most farmers, bad roads. Um, having been a problem for us, lack of inputs. For us, that I'm a crop farmer, for me to get good inputs into for what I'm going to plant is so hard. Okay, look at poultry farmers. They can't assess maize. So something like egg, I was buying 770 farm gate beginning of the year. is selling for 1,001. So by the time it gets to your table, it's about 1,005 and 2,000. Yeah. Wow. So these are some of the challenges. Look at, you talked about Zamparasis. I was even about to talk about that before you guys talked about it. They make you pay to come and harvest. And they also had them pay before they were able to assess their farms to plant. So at the end of the day, these are just a few of what we farmers go through to put food on the table for many of the families in Nigeria. So if these are the challenges, you know, first of all, I'd like to know if the government is very much aware of these existing challenges you know, that the farmers are facing? Is there something like some channel that you, you, you um, that the, the government is hearing from what, I mean, from you guys as farmers, what you're saying? Or me, I'm part of you. <laughs> we, we, we have different channels. I mean, insecurity is everywhere in the country. That one we know. There's no state or which, well, no area that will say it's particularly safe. So like we in Ekbe, the roads were so bad during the rainy season that farmers were losing produce. I grow sweet corn. So by the time I move my sweet corn from Ekbe to Lekki area, the heat in the, in the van in which I'm moving it, half of the sweet corn is cooked. Sometimes the buses have to stay, the delivery trucks have to sleep on the road to be able to get into town. We wrote letters, we called the commissioner for agri, we spoke to a lot of people. Now they say they are fixing the roads, but a lot of farmers have lost money. The government knows about the security that's happening. Farmers haven't been able to assess their farms in the Northeast. And the north is where most of the food production is happening. So they can't say they don't know what is happening. They know what is happening. They go to the market. You feel the cost. Look at um, onions that were selling for 22,000 some months that are selling to 75,000. They go to market. Their spouses go to market. There's somebody who's telling them there's something happening with the food. But as usual, government is playing lip service to what they need to do. And based on what you said about FAO, the food this security problem is going to be a major one in 2021. We have just not even scribed the surface of what's going to happen. Oh my God. Wow. It's, but it's, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, why, um, Kira, why would you think that the government doesn't um, prioritize this, considering the fact that, um, well, this is food we are talking about, and even the government, they need food to survive. You know, and it's not just them, they have their family. So why, would, why do you think they're, they're not considering this food security or the looming food scarcity? Why do you think it's not a priority to them? Is it not the same government that had emergency palliative locked up and people mm. were dying yes, of hunger? So. Are we not in the same country? Wow. So it's not, at, at, at any time when it comes to agriculture, government has a tendency to pay leave service. And that is exactly what is happening. Many of them can afford food. You and I know that a lot of people at the bottom of the pyramid are day workers. Mm. So they, they only they, they earn us. So the only money they earn in the day is what they used to buy food. So government cannot tell me they are not aware. If they are not aware, they shouldn't be in power because they should know what is happening. We have spoken to them on different platforms. I come to the TV, I talk about it. We talk to the representative, but nothing is happening. Wow, Inkuru. So <laughs> we've not even got in. And it, you know the story is so gory. And I, I just want to ask, when you talk about organizations, is there 
um, because I've had this argument of saying that there's too many fragmented organizations like agricultural organizations that you do not have a strong voice. How true is that? And is there one body that represents the interest of farmers and the interest of you know, agriculturists in Nigeria? Can you authoritatively say, like we have in the oil industry, when you hear the name Pengasan or you, when you hear Asu, you know that those units are strong enough. Do you think that there's a problem uh, of with not having, structure. yes, with, with not having a very strong vo voice when it comes to the, the an organization that speaks in the agri space? Yes, the problem is that, you're right, it's fragmented. And because there are so many sections on the agri sector, the poultry people's problem is different from the crop production, is different from the pork, a pork section. So every section is trying to fight for their survival or trying to get things for themselves. We're highly um, fragmented, you're right. But sometimes they have two groups that have stood out. And one was NESG. They have the agri, the, um, agri sector of the ENS, EN, NESG, Nigeria Economic Summit Group, that have tried to do some work. There's also the NE, Nigeria Agri Business with NABG. But for a while, I can tell you, I haven't heard what they, are, what they are saying or what they are doing. But you're right. There's so much fragmentation in the agri sector. So we're not really speaking from, from one voice. So it makes it hard for government to hear us. And so people, they're talking, some are producing federally, some are producing in states. But, you know, yes, you're right. The fragmentation is actually what is affecting us. We don't have a common voice. NABG was supposed to do that, but I can tell you, they haven't lived up to that um, role. Okay, so I, I was going to follow up with another question. Um, let's even say um, that the government, you know, has an ear, yeah, because I know that there have been little pockets of um, funds, uh, intervention funds, and also grants targeted at the agri space. How easy is it to get these funds? Because um, access to funds is one thing. You know, access to finance is one thing, then security is another thing. But in dealing with the access to finance, do you think these various interventions like the nurse and um, some other, inf um, other agri interventions, are they really accessible and do they help farmers? Um, the analogy I'll use is this. It will be easier to fail and a donkey to pass through the eye of the needle for them for you to get that fund. Oh. Hmm. The rules, the regulations, the conditions are so draconian that it is not worth it. Mm. So I, I, I belong to so many agri groups. I mean, on my fingerprint, I can reach 500 farmers. None of us on any of the groups have been able to assess it. We're educated, we're connected. So it's not a case of we don't know to, how to write the right, answer the right questions and the rest. First of all, when you want to get um, some of those intervention funds like NISA funds, they make you go for a training through some approved consultant. That's a racket the group is running. That is a racket because I don't know what they're teaching me, which I don't know after I have my MBA to be able to assess money and you pay for that. Wow. So that's even where the problem comes. And if you don't go for that training, you can't assess that fund. And then you now start meeting all the conditions of the fund. It is not, when I hear people telling me there's so much money in the agri sector, I say the politicians are giving it to their friends and family. We that are players in the industry are not getting it. So please, nobody should tell me that the intervention funds in the agri sector. Show me one farmer who has gotten it by just standing up, going there, filling the form and getting it without having to have people speak on their behalf. Then there is not an intervention fund if it still has to go through the Nigerian process of knowing somebody to know somebody to be able to assess it. Thank you so much. I totally much. agree. Well, like, yeah. Well, um, <laughs> writing on the, the same fund um, um, question, um, I was reading part of the challenges on the global uh, scale right now. And one of um, um, the, the panelists listed that gender inequality is a major factor, considering the fact that most times when men are able to get access to loans, women don't. And you just pointed out the fact that generally, in Nigeria, it's difficult to get access to loans for everybody. But let's talk about you being a woman in agriculture as a farmer. What really is it like managing your space, getting loans, and every other thing that is because, involved in the production cycle? Because in Kiru, I know that there are lots of funds available for female entrepreneurs. In fact, a friend of mine that works in Bank of Industry has been on my neck 
forcing me to take a loan. Do you understand? So there are phones available. Yeah. So are you trying to tell us that, you know, is it that it's just paper documentation or these things, you know, it is very nice on paper. It's not, mm. pract it's not you can't access that. It's nice on paper you can access that. Wow. Wow. But the loan is accessible if anybody can walk out, walk up the streets, enter BOI and get the loan. You just said a female friend of yours in BOI. For those, so, so those who don't have that access, they can't walk into the bank and get the money. They can't, they just keep turning them around, sending them from one place to the other. When I talked about the loan, I said many times, it turns to the same Nigerian thing of who do you know, who do you talk to, who can push your paper for you. Mm. The average woman can walk out the streets and walk in and get the loans. Mm. Sometimes what they're asking for you, as a farmer, every farmer, your biggest asset you have is land. You know the inheritance law of land in Nigeria. Most women don't have access to land. So even when the loans are there and they're telling you what you have to put on the table, the women don't have anything to put on the table for, the, exactly. for, 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 for their big loan. So that now becomes a barrier. That is why also some men seem to have more land, some access to phone than women. Because if you don't have land, you can even give us collateral. What? I mean, land that is registered. Thank Nobody's you. going to give you any loan because as much as they say, you still have to put something as collateral to, to assess some of the loan Inkiru. or get a guarantor and things like that. Inkiru. So this thing you've just said, right, because we are staying on this loan issue. And I told her, I said, it is difficult for you to come and meet me as a farmer, to ask me to give you another property other than the farmland that I have, right? The property, the collateral I yeah. have is my farmland. So if you cannot use that as a collateral to be able to give me money, then why are you bothering me? In fact, that's why I did not answer them. Because that's the point. Now you say go and bring so, a property. So if you were to advise, you are a farmer. Maybe the bank in the I mean the financial industries they are listening, and you are a farmer for goodness sake. What else would you give as a collateral if you were to advise the people that are creating this um, what's it called the policies and the structures around accessing these loans? What are the kind of things that you would put down as a collateral? It has to be different from properties. So, so you see, you answer the question. My own experience when I tried to assess Bank of Agri Club, what they told me was, did I have a property in Banana? So I said, well, is it Banana Republic or another banana? And I told the lady, if I had money, if I had property in Banana, I shouldn't it be coming to be BOA, BOA to take money. Mm -hmm. Many of these policies are designed by technocrats who are not players in the industry. I am a farmer, I know how it hits me. So they have to work hand in hand with government. The biggest asset feature, right, I've told you, as a farmer is land. So they have to change the land, the um, 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 how I said, the the registration of land. So land used for agri should be given expedited um, uh, approval so you can use it to unlock the finance. Mm -hmm. Most of us have land, but the process of getting documentation from the land is it's so cumbersome that we don't, we don't bother. And, and so that can't unlock finance for you. Mm -hmm. So it behoves the state governments, because land belongs to the states, to be able to have an expedited way for land that are like earmarked for agriculture, strictly for agriculture, to get expedited CMLM. C O mm -hmm. so we can now use it to unlock finance and give it to BOI or BOA. That's it. Because I can't take the property I'm living on to go get a bank loan for a farming mm -hmm. that my family is not part of. It is only me that's doing the farming. That will not work for anybody. <laughs> okay, Kiru. I, in fact, eh, I should give you a hug, a virtual hug. All right, so we'll take a short break. When we return, we'll continue the conversation. Please stay with us.